Guys, please help yourself to coffee too, whatever you want. Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us today for another intriguing uh, discussion. Talk. We've got uh, Neil Gibson from ISVE tonight. Uh, I've known Neil about over a day <laughs> So uh, Neil is, is the head of VE sales, but really very, very knowledgeable about the technical aspects of the software and where it's going with its development. So uh, I've been using IS before Neil started. <laughs> I've been using IIS since 1999, when it's mostly DOS-based at that point. Yes. So uh, it's, a, it's a very good software, and uh, I'd like to leave the floor to you. Just tell us about all the exciting things that are happening. Thank you very much, Naveen. Thank you very much to everybody for coming along tonight uh, and listening to me. So um, I appreciate that. I'm going to try and... Um, so with, with these kind of presentations, I get quite nervous because I'm never really sh too sure who I'm speaking to, okay, and if I've got a wide range of people, so I've got, so we'll, we'll, we'll go through the presentation, and uh, but I'm happy, obviously, uh, I'm pleased to see there's room for questions at the end, so I'm happy to have a good discussion on anything at all uh, to, do with, to do with this. Um, so Naveen has said that everybody in the room is an expert in ISB, <laughs> Is this right? Is every, who, who has used ISB? Put, put your hands up. We've got one, two, three, okay. Right, okay. Okay, so we've got a kind of, we've got a kind of remix. That's fine, that's fine, that's okay. All right, so, yeah, as the name says, my name's uh, Neil, and uh, today I'm going to do a kind of overview of building simulation. So I'm not saying future trends, and we'll, and we'll get to that point, but really we'll kind of like, and cover all things building simulation um, uh, on that. But before I get started, what I will say is that I do work for a company called IES, who are excellent at what they do, um, but I'm not here to do a sales presentation, okay? So everybody can just relax, I'm not selling it to you. But I will be talking about IES and I will be talking about technology because that's, that's the world that I live in, right? And that's, that's my kind of my view on and simulation and things, okay? So I'm happy to be challenged that, you know, other, there's other software codes like design builder and stuff like that, you know, and that's fine. I'm happy to, we're just talking about building simulation. So um, I thought best just to introduce myself very quickly. I'm not going to dwell on this too much and then introduce IES and then we can get moving into the presentation. Uh, so I do, by the accident, as uh, you'll have guessed correctly, I do come from Glasgow. I was, um, I, I was brought up there. I've moved around. I've since moved back and I'm there with my family uh, and my two kids um, and actually I really like coming to Newcastle, I was saying this uh, earlier while I was having my coffee, um, because I always think Newcastle and Glasgow there's a lot of uh, parallels between the two cities, uh, very strong industrial backgrounds, a bit of a challenge post-industrial, trying to reinvent itself. Um, uh, but there is lots of interesting things going on. Glasgow, for example, just like Newcastle, have got some amazing architecture going on. Okay, if you look for it, you can find it. Uh, that's uh, Zaha Hadid, um, uh, the Riverside Museum in Glasgow. Uh, that crazy roof line um, is, it follows the, 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 uh, the River Clyde through Glasgow. Okay, it's an amazing building, not just for the contents in it, but for what it's actually doing. Ah, yes, work. Um, uh, uh, very closely with that building actually, and I might touch on that later. Uh, myself, I studied engineering, mechanical and electrical engineering at Strathclyde University. Um, I really enjoyed uh, what I did there, so I then joined the army, spent a few years in the army. I uh, thought that, uh, well, that was great, but what I really wanted to do was get back into engineering. So I went back to Strathclyde, did my masters, and I was with a um, I, I, I actually got um, a scholarship for uh, a, a master's there in, in a department called the ESRU, Energy Systems and Research uh, Unit, 
and at that time, it, there was um, a couple of really interesting people there that, made, that had a big influence on me. It was uh, uh, Professor Joe Clark and Dr. Don McLean, okay? And these guys um, were very passionate about building simulation, sustainability, the challenges of the built environment, and you couldn't help but get, kind of get sucked into that world. So that's what I did. I then uh, became a sustainable engineer, if you like, uh, across some uh, leading uh, um, design practices uh, in the UK, uh, engineering and architectural, and then I landed into IES. I won't tell you all about that, but I've been at IES for uh, um, quite a bit over a decade now, actually. Uh, as it happens, integrated environmental solutions. So, for those of you that know a little bit about IES, um, uh, we are 29 years old, we'll be 30 years old this summer, which is incredible. Um, we have uh, lots of users um, that use our technology around the world. That, okay, I should say, IES is a technology group, we develop everything in house, we provide it to the marketplace. Um, uh, technology of various technologies, including ISBE, which is what we're kind of famous for, that's what uh, you're all experts in. Uh, but there are other technologies, and this, there's a big focus on this, and I'll come back to that later on. Um, but we also provide it in place, okay? So, I'll give you a wee flavour about the, 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 um, uh, the company uh, there. Uh, I will just say, because this is a university, we do have internships, we do have graduate programmes, um, and there's lots of research and development going on as well. So I'm just warming up. Um, okay, so people to come in. So and I, I just wanted to, I wasn't too sure, uh, wasn't too sure, uh, I, I, thought, I thought actually I'd put this in just because I wanted to explain what I mean by building simulation, okay, because I'm going to be talking a lot about building simulation. And, um, and, and doing that. So really what I'm talking about here is um, a, a 3D modelling tool that has a thermal engine, a simulation engine in it. Um, you create your, your model and you're then able to, uh, so, you, so you put your building in there, so the geometry, you put your constructions in there, your systems, your orientation, your weather file, that's your benchmark model. And then you want to then test uh, that model for uh, a variety of build performance metrics, okay? So and what we mean by that is different analysis. So that might be, uh, you know, if I've got to be, no, I've got, uh, it might be daylighting, it might be energy and carbon, uh, it might be embodied carbon, it might be artificial lighting, it might be uh, people movement, fire evacuation, it might be costs, regulations, whatever, okay? And the whole idea of building simulation tools, regardless of which one you're using, is that as you start manipulating the model and making changes, you can have an understanding of what's happening to the entire building. What is the impact that you're having there uh, on, on that? So that's, that's what I mean by building simulation uh, uh, tools. Anyway, the title of the presentation uh, really is looking at future trends of building simulation. Uh, but as Carl Sagan has said, to understand what's coming, you need to understand your past. Okay, so we want to go back in time a little bit. Um, uh, uh, and so let's look at the past. Okay, so the first thing is building physics. So when did building physics start? Building physics have always been with us. I had actually forgotten I put that slide in, but anyway. But the, um, there is something about mankind from the very beginning that we understand that we... Uh, uh, we understand our context within the environment and we need to provide uh, shelter, uh, safety, you know, whether it's from aggressive looking um, animals and, and look after our family um, uh, uh, within that environment, right? And, and, and that's not just for mankind, that's for anything in nature. You just need to look, you can look anywhere for that. So building physics has always been, uh, maybe not understood, but a subconscious thing that is, that's gone with being a living being. Um, we, um, but moving on, really what I'm talking about here in the past is pre-digitisation of the construction industry and um, uh, building simulation um, uh, fits within this. So 
we're looking at this picture where we're looking at maybe the 1950s and 1960s, and this is how we design buildings, okay? Whether it's an architectural practice or an engineering, we just had lots of men with the same haircut, the same shirts, the same ties, the same desks, and big bits of paper, and they, uh, they design buildings, okay? And they were able to do this uh, with a high degree of um, uh, success, but through uh, successful communication through verbal communication and um, and, uh, and drawings, right? That was their that was their, their kind of tools. They were able to do that, and that was all fine. Um, um, and you know, they produced buildings um, that were of a certain type, and a lot of these buildings still stand today. They far exceeded the the, the life expectancy of what you would expect of those type of buildings. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them. They were able to do it. It worked. But mainly, the buildings that we got from there are not uh, remarkable design buildings. Yes, there's like the brutalist movement and the various architecture movements that's gone on, but they were typically um, square, boxy buildings with square windows, and they kind of looked in a particular uh, in a particular way. Uh, and maybe part of that was a constraint of that process. Um, maybe it's like post-war and the finance isn't there in the same way, and there was a need. Uh, to create those buildings, but either way, this is what was produced, right? Uh, I don't know if anybody recognises these buildings uh, at all. Uh, these are in, yeah, yes, yes. These are from Newcastle. I did put in some buildings from Newcastle, and then I realised I was looking at Newcastle, Australia, and I wondered why there was so much sunshine in Newcastle. So okay, so there we go. Anyway, Alan Turing developed the computer during the Second World War. To, uh, uh, to defeat the Enigma uh, um, uh, machine, right? And the application of computational power started to then filter its way in in the 60s into a commercial setting. Who could afford that? It was the finance sector, okay? When you're buying and selling shares and you're making uh, transactional uh, commitments, uh, speed and accuracy um, uh, was vital, so therefore um, uh, um, uh, we were able to start to see uh, the likes of these these um, these type of machines, okay? But that's not like what you see today, okay? This is like tailor-made machines that would be in a room on one floor in a building with skilled operators that were only allowed to be in that room. Nobody else was trained, okay? Uh, this guy here is a guy called Ivan Sutherland, okay? 1962, and what he had built was the sketch pad. Okay, so he's actually drawing on that machine there in 1962, but that's got nothing to do with this talk. Uh, it's more about the imagery of what this, this a room of a computer, right? This is the idea. Very simple, uh, you know, very low process power. Your fridge probably has more process power than this thing in terms of today, but uh, absolute mind blowing. Start to see this thing filter into other sectors like um, space, aeronautical, that sort of stuff. As we move through time, we get to the 80s and the 90s, and then we start to see CAD going, moving to computational power, right? So something like this that we sort of recognize as an actual computer. Um, uh, some of you guys won't even know what this is. That's like floppy disks. You would never have heard of that before. But anyway, there we go. So, um, but again, it wasn't ubiquitous, it wasn't universal. You wouldn't have this on every designer's desk. There would be one or two in the firm. You would have specialists operating this, CAD technicians, for example, and their job was to do that. But revolutionising what they were doing. Think back to that room with all those guys drawing and then taking out their erasers and rubbing it out and then doing it again. Here, you're able to um, do a huge amount of accuracy um, if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter, you can go straight back, delete, done, never happened, right? Really interesting. But we're starting to move into dialogue, um, not just verbal and written in drawings, but technology and data as well. That's the key point here, okay? Also, this is probably Naveen, this, this is kind of like the start of IES as well, okay? Where you start putting in numbers and we go, wow, it's done a loads calculation in, in like 20 minutes. Okay, um, this is the power. This is where building simulation starts to take off. All the theory was there, but now we're able to put computational power behind it. That's, that's kind of what I'm trying to get to. And then you move to something like today, um, where 
we're doing to think about it. Everybody's got computers, you've got at least one screen on the desk, if not five. You've got iPads, you've got your phone, um, you've got all of that working. We're talking, communicating constantly, uh, and making those uh, real-time decisions on, uh, on projects. And it's everywhere, okay? It's everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're in an engineering sector or not, uh, you, you, you've got that. So that takes us up to today. And then suddenly with computational power, um, uh, and all of this dialogue, um, we're able to start to really push the limits of architecture and engineering, and this is starting to come through in the buildings that we're doing. Hopefully you recognise these buildings. Um, yes, um, hopefully this one, uh, and that's obviously iconic. I actually did have a really good one of uh, uh, that Australian university one as well, but um, it's good if applied, although you'll, you'll, you'll see. You'll, uh, you'll see that, but that's fine. But look, this is great, Newcastle, look at it, amazing, okay? So this brings us up to the present. Okay, so let's focus now on building simulation. I'm going to stop waffling and get to the point. Um, so building simulation can benefit from computa computational power, that's what's made it uh, take on. Um, the whole point there is, you know, the whole point about the computational power is that it can do the heavy loading that a human being just can. There are so many variables within any given building. I mean, this building that we're in just now, trying to understand uh, temperature, airflow, uh, mass, uh, you know, and then embodied carbon and lighting. Like you're never going to, no designer can do that uh, themselves. Um, computation uh, can, do, can, 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 can do the, the heavy lifting for you. There are obviously loads and loads of different simulation tools available uh, to the marketplace. The one with the biggest logo is the best. Uh, that's a rule, but the, there is loads of other ones out there, okay? And over time, over the last 30, 40 years, there's been various ones that have come and gone. However, what do you think is the most used software tool in construction today? Does anybody want to hazard a guess? Is it BIM? Is it BIM? It's a good answer, but uh, no, not quite. That was good. Anybody else wanted to throw up a solution? The Excel. Who said that? You said, yeah, it is, it's Excel. Have you seen this presentation before? Uh, I worked. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay, so actually this is an interesting point, is that I, I speak to loads of people, um, so I'm mainly based in the UK, and I speak to uh, lots of engineers uh, and architects, and you would not believe that we Jimmy, right, and he says, look, I don't need this, I don't need building simulation in my life, I've got my Excel, my, my spreadsheet, I've used that for 30 years, you know, and I'm saying to Jimmy, look, you might have made a mistake in your spreadsheet like 29 years ago, and for 29 years you've been making the same mistake, I don't know, but it's absolutely true, it's, it's, you know, we are making, we are constantly pushing the envelope of what can be uh, built, um, uh, you know, what can be built, um, uh, and yet, in that supply chain, the use of Excel trying to ca uh, solve complex problems. Uh, that, so this is a bit of an issue. There is an issue about um, uh, training and education and upskilling. Um, okay, I'll kind of keep going. Uh, so the Boeing 777, the reason I put that in here, okay, it was a bit, maybe a bit random, but uh, does anybody know why this is quite famous in terms of an engineering project? And do you want to be? It's famous because it's the first uh, fully designed uh, airplane by um, uh, by computer by uh, by CAD. Okay, and it's quite interesting because the whole point here is up until this point, um, the uh, when you when you designed an airplane, you would do mock-ups of the plane of the various bits that you were designing, and then eventually what you do is you stick all the mock-ups together, and you have a dummy plane, and you see if it works. So what they did was they said, right, well, we'll try this computer business and we'll give it a shot. And they did a mock-up of the front nose, but it was so good, so accurate, so precise, that they said, look, we don't need to do the mock-ups. So we'll just do this computer-aided design. It saved the design process tens of millions of pounds on that bit alone. Um, and it's one of the most successful airplanes uh, uh, moving forward. The point here is... That the aeronautical engineer, uh, uh, sector, engineering sector, were doing this uh, at 1990. October 1990, that plane was launched. Okay. Um, so where are we in construction in terms of um, advancement in digitisation? 
so this is a bit of a random graph. I don't know if you've seen it before. It does get bandied about a little bit. Um, it's McKinsey um, did this, but it's a kind of heat map. Okay, so basically all you need to know um, is if you're kind of proper blue, then you're very digital. And if you're grey, then you're very not digital, okay? And if we look here, we've got the different sectors. And we start up here with um, ICT, very, very digital, but we'd expect that, okay? Um, and then we sort of move down, okay, let's see. So where do we get construction? So we've got finance, okay, that's all good. We've got pharmaceuticals, that's all good. Manufacturing, okay, where are we? Although we're just above agriculture and hunting. Right, that's where we are. That's where we are. Okay, so we're right down here. So we think we're doing pretty well. We think we're doing BIM. We think we're doing awesome simulation, uh, but we're we're not really not really compared to others. Okay. Now there's a, some massive caveats in here. The first thing is this is probably looking at all construction. So what we're talking about here is again, we Jimmy, he's building his house. He's building the house probably the same methods that we've been doing it for 100 years, block, mortar, block, mortar, block, right, in the rain. Um, uh, and, you know, building simulation is a, is a very small part of construction. But actually, this, this, this is true, this, is, this resonates. Uh, we, are, we think we're pushing boundaries, uh, but we're really not, you know. Like we've got a lot to learn, um, you know, so there's big conversations about... Um, about data, building data, feedback loops, improvement, learning from buildings that we've built. You know, did that innovation work? Did it not work? Um, you know, whereas Formula One cars have been doing that for 15 years, right? Planes have been doing that since the 1990s. Uh, so there's a lot kind of going on uh, there. Um, so, so we've got a lot to do. <laughs> But we've got a lot of drivers as well, so there's a lot going on, there's a lot of pressure on designers um, um, uh, in, in, in terms of the objectives they've got with buildings. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So I don't know if you've kind of heard of some of these before, but I'll kind of touch on them. But uh, the, the, the general essence of this is, uh, you know, there's obviously a massive move to being net zero or close to net zero. Um, and so there's lots of regulatory and compliance drivers that designers have to meet on new buildings, okay? Um, so, and this is, the, this, is the, this is where our big role of building simulation comes in place. This is how we do it, this is how we prove uh, that we think that design is going to meet that, or in operation that it, that it has actually done that. So we've got the Royal Institute of British Architects, they've got the 2030 challenge, that feeds in very nicely with Letty, that's the London Energy Transformation Initiative. Um, these two things kind of are, 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 um, uh, uh, work together. Uh, we've got like Neighbours. I don't know if you know about Neighbours. So Neighbours has come from, okay, what country do you think Neighbours have come from? Australia. Yes, so Neighbours have come from Australia. So Neighbours is uh, a, a rating system for buildings in operation, right? And the idea there is that every year, buildings who are going for neighbours um, get uh, their performance evaluated and then they have an action plan moving forward. So they're continually improving their buildings. Uh, they have a star rating. So what you want with a neighbours rating is to kind of get as many stars as you can. The more st stars you get, the more sustainable your building is, uh, the more pounds per square metre uh, 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 you can rent that building for. It's pretty important. That neighbours building, uh, the neighbours approach has just been adopted by the UK, and um, and we're doing that. So we've started doing that with commercial buildings, where you're going to see that go throughout um, uh, uh, non, any new non-domestic building. Basically, is, is is the idea there. But what's really interesting about that is you have to do a design for performance model at design stage. Okay, so I'll look at. If I start saying things that just don't make any sense, then just say, okay, and I'll, I'll skip through. But um, there's like TM54, that's a SIBSE methodology. And what that does is when you're doing your building simulation, if you approach, if you use this methodology, it, it guides you through how to create a, a, a proper full energy model of that building at the design stage. That's this, and that's aligned with design for performance. So you do this, so you have at design stage, your full energy model, and then once the building's built, you're then um, uh, you're then looking at uh, 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 measurement and verification of that building, uh, and then 
looking to you know tie those two things together and then improve that building ongoing. And this is this is the this is the future of what's going on, or this is what's happening now actually. Um, and if you've got Bream and Lead, and hopefully you know about these things. These are kind of environmental assessment methods, uh, which go beyond just the operational energy, but they look at carbon, they look at daylighting, they look at a view out, um, uh, secure by design, all that kind of stuff. It's all pretty interesting. So there's lots of pressure on designers, um, uh, on, our, on, our, uh, on buildings and making buildings perform and the need for building performance uh, simulation, okay? But of course, so the future, so let's look at the future. So let's look at the opportunities and the challenges for, um, uh, for us uh, coming down the line. So, um, so the big one's net zero, okay? So this is the thing. So now we've got to do net zero. Everything's got to be net zero. And, um, and, but it's a very simple idea. It's a very complex um, uh, question, actually, uh, challenge. So really, uh, I want to split buildings into two types. Okay, so we've got new buildings. Now, obviously, they should be net zero. They should be designed to be net zero and they should be built to be net zero. We shouldn't be introducing new building stock that has any negative impact on the planet, right? That's the, that's the plan. And the thing is, do you know what? We're actually quite good at that, right? To a certain degree, because we've spent so long, we've had very clever people develop technology, develop methodologies. We've got lots of experience and knowledge to do this. So we can, we're pretty good at it, right? We just are. Uh, the, probably, the bigger challenge is the existing building stock, right? And so people always talk about, I don't know, it's something like by 2050, I think something like 95% of the building stock in 2050 will be the building stock that's already existed. Something like that. There's a, some, or maybe it's 90%, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, the, 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 the truth is though, that that's a massive challenge. Just the sheer volume of existing buildings and how do we make that uh, net zero. Uh, but that's a different challenge. This, this is the kind of key point here that we've got. So how do we do that? Well, actually, um, we don't need to worry or do anything because we've got nuclear fusion, right? So we've got nuclear fusion, so we've got limitless energy. It's free. We can keep the lights on. No, okay, we don't, we don't have that yet. Okay, so that's, we've got nuclear fusion. It's coming along, but it's decades away, okay? And, and it might come, but climate change is real. We, can't, we don't have time to wait, we need to act. We need to act then, okay, so we don't need to worry. But, but that's, that's ridiculous, okay. So, anyway, looking at the future, what do we need to think about technology? Um, well, actually, I think there's two very clear problems that we've got, two big challenges that we've got uh, as an industry. So we've got the, uh, this is meant to be like the new, the new buildings that we're doing, and this is the existing buildings. So new buildings, that's no problem. Look, we've got technology, we've got building simulation technology, uh, we've got the uh, methodologies, we've got the data, we can tackle that, that's fine. Uh, we've got the manpower resource to do that. But this is a different story altogether. But what we need to do is we need to rethink building simulation and apply it. And this is, the, this is one of the things that, um, uh, you know, uh, that maybe we're a wee bit faulty on is we constantly think that we can solve all, both of these things using the same solution, but one solution isn't going to fix everything, right? So we can, there's, there's, it's ridiculous to think that we can, we can start to full TM54 type models on every single building in the world. That's just not going to happen. We can't do it. There's not enough of you guys to do it, right? Um, but we need to rethink about how we, how we do this. So, you know, Pareto rule, does anybody know about the Pareto rule? I love the Pareto rule. Ever, anybody ever heard of that before? No? Very uh, so, so not optimize it, not in the rule, not in, that's the Pareto curve you're thinking about in the, um, so the Pareto rule is, it takes, it's the 80-20 split, right? So where it takes like 20% of the effort to achieve 80% of something, and then it takes 80% of the effort to do the last 20%. So if we apply that here, you know, with the existing building stock, uh, we just need to get improvement. And even if a high level tool or a light use of building simulation, if we can reduce the carbon emissions by 80%, uh, that's good enough, right? And then over time, we can then bring this kind of approach to kind of nail the rest of it. Um, or nuclear fusion can come in and just solve everything for everybody. Um, we, we will see 
So we need different solutions. That's the, that's the idea. Okay. Uh, another point I wanted to make. Oh. Okay. There's no picture there. Okay. It's obviously a picture of air. No, I don't buy that. Okay. I've del obviously deleted the picture off there. That's fine. Um, so one of the things okay, that's going on in building simulation is, and I constantly say that, I say, I say this all the time, I say, oh no, we've got all the performance metrics, it's fine. Like everybody does the performance metrics, we've got it covered. Uh, it's really about um, um, other, how we use building simulation, that's where the real growth area is. And then the minute I say that, I, I end up listening to something and then I realise, oh no, we, we've got something else coming in. So for example, indoor air quality, uh, the reason that's up there is because uh, this week on Tuesday, we launched a capability in the in the VE. Okay, I'm, I'm not plugging this, but is uh, for in, for indoor air, air quality. Okay, so why are we doing that? Well, there's been so when you solve a problem, you realise that actually there's another problem to be solved. Okay, and this is the this is the thing, and this is really interesting about simulation. So what, even though we're looking at a blank screen, um, is the uh, one of the big movements other than net zero, has been around overheating. So in the UK, we've got a big issue, unbelievably, about overheating. I live in Glasgow, I live in a new built house. Two weeks every summer, my house is unbelievably hot, right, in Glasgow, right? In 2022, um, we had temperatures in excess of 42 degrees Celsius. We had record heat-related deaths. Um, so there's been a big movement in the UK on, on overheating doing that, that's fine. Uh, there's uh, been a regulatory compliance approach called Part, uh, part O, part for overheating, O for overheating, um, and, um, and, and that's all okay. But what's really interesting is, you know, so you start, you're designing your high-rise block of um, apartments uh, in London, and you're obviously trying to reduce the, uh, uh, the energy impact, or the carbon impact of that, um, that block, but at the same time, you need to be thinking about part O, so you need to be thinking about ventilation. Um, so you're not allowed to put in mechanical ventilation, uh, 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 mechanical solutions. That's going to increase you. That's going to impact your energy side. So you need to start looking at openable windows and bringing in ventilation that way. But you're doing this in London. Uh, you're probably doing this, in, you know, uh, where there is, you know, subject to serious heat island effects. Um, but it's also got some of the worst air pollution as well, right? So you, you now you're opening the window and you're bringing that in. So now as designers, we need to start looking at uh, air quality and pollutants coming in the, in the building as well and balancing all that out. So that's another uh, big movement that we're going to see uh, just now, okay? Um, okay, so interoperability in the VMware, we were just talking about this uh, in a slightly different tact, um, but it's always worth uh, kind of talking, to, talking about it, is that I get asked all the time, listen, you should just develop this in the software and just have it all within the software, okay? And I'm like, yes, I really want to do that. That'd be amazing. Uh, but we can't. Nobody can, right? And, uh, but what you can do is um, make sure that you connect well. You've got good data exchange with the right people, the right platforms, okay? So what we're seeing here is we've got, uh, you know, whether it's arch the architectural drawing side, you want to say Revit or Rhino um, uh, or... A, Mechanical designs uh, tools like Magicad and Trimble, um, you may, like one click LCA, they do body carbon, and you have a connection there, or other compliance, or even Leica. And so we work very hard uh, to do that, and we're constantly doing this. We're constantly, and so we're, uh, and it's really great, and it's really interesting for us is that people come to come to us and say, look, we think we need to do that, and it, and it, it does, you know. Um, uh, so and basically, we're giving designers the ecosystem. But we're not responsible for all of it, uh, uh, you know. But we're responsible for being the best at what we do, and this is what you've got to do. This is what you've got to got to work with. But the exchange has got to be there. Lek is really interesting. That's a new one. Uh, so if you go on YouTube, you'll see lots of different things in there if you want to do it. But what's really interesting here is you think, okay, great. So I can get my um, I can now laser scan a building, uh, create my point clouds, and I can bring that into my energy model and then do my my, my performance analysis in there, which is great, okay? But actually this is, going back to the question about um, the different types of buildings and our existing building stock, um, how do you get to this point with existing buildings? So this is where, this, this is 
this kind of approach becomes vital, right? So there's uh, different compliance, a compliance thing called MEES in the UK, um, was that mini minimum energy efficiency standard or something like that? And basically what you've got is you've got a whole lot of guys going out to buildings to survey them, they're using their laser and notepad and they're drawing up and it's taking days to do something like this. Whereas with advancements in technology on the laser scanning side, uh, it can cut that, cut that right down. And in this particular project, this happens to be our headquarters in Glasgow. Um, unlike that, that's a terrible picture because it's only one floor, but it's actually two floors. But they came in and they scanned that entire building inside and out in 12 minutes. Right? And they reckon the actual time to get us into a model in the virtual environment took an hour. And it, it's like phenomenal. So you start to think about what that means and what that means for industry and business and on that side of things. Um, so, uh, so technology is moving forward and all the rest of it. Okay. Um, so AI, so everybody talks about AI just now, right? So AI, so what's going to happen in building simulation of AI? Uh, there you go, that's your... Uh, so uh, the AI is, without doubt, uh, going to be the next phase in building simulation, right? Anybody involved in uh, building simulation, you will be using AI without even uh, thinking about it, okay? Um, talking about optimization just now, that's effectively AI, right? Genetic algorithms, uh, 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 machine learning. Um, so for those that... Uh, that don't know, so as I, I mentioned a couple of slides ago about the idea about, that I say, oh, we've got all the analysis in the, in the software, it's about how you use building simulation. So what I mean by that is, uh, lots of people, when they, they use a building simulation tool, they use it in a very sequential, linear way, right? So what they do is they come in, they sit down, they open up a model, they put all the data entry to get the model ready, and then they press go, and then it simulates, right? And then they have a cup of tea, and then they come back, and then it finishes, they get the results, and then they analyze the results, and then they say, right, okay, I need to now, so I'll, I'll set up for the next simulation, run the simulation, and so on and so on, right? So that's a very linear process, one simulation at a time. Um, what, what's really interesting now, um, and really over the last decade, has been moving to a sort of parallel um, approach, right? So using parametric and optimization techniques. So when, so imagine sitting down at the computer, right? And you set up your simulation, but instead of saying specifically what you want to do, you want to you want to talk about. Uh, uh, you say, well, look, you know, let's look at. Um, I want to look within this area, right? So if you can change the orientation of the building, for example, by ninety degrees, you say, well, let's let's uh, do ninety simulations going from you know, zero degrees to 90 degrees, and let's do that. That's, that's allowable within my design. Let's see the impact of what happens. But at the same time, I want to look at... Um, uh